So today's discussion is about the history and the origin of the Rajputs. So let me begin by the most obvious question, which is who were and who are the Rajput people? Um, see, the, the question of origin becomes clear the moment we observe that uh, the, the Rajputs are just a subset of Kshatriyas that uh, persisted in the north in the medieval era. Now, uh, the Rajputs have previously been known as Rajaputras, Rajanyas, uh, as well as Kshatriyas, before the ascension of uh, apabhranj based languages. So what happens is that uh, around the 13th, uh, 14th century, the apabhranj based languages uh, get the ascension and Sanskrit uh, as a mainstream language begins to recede and vanish. It is not to say that Sanskrit was an extinct language at that time, but it didn't have the uh, the mainstream presence anymore. So, and and with that linguistic shift uh, from Sanskrit to Apabhranj, the term Rajputra became Rajput. So this happens around the 13th century. Now, <clears throat> the the reason why we are discussing, uh, you know, e this is even a topic of discussion is that there's a lot of uh, propaganda and debate going on around the, the origin of uh, Rajputs. And uh, what they do is uh, they, they misuse these subtle changes of terminology to, to project as if the, the Kshatriyas, the Rajputras and Rajputs, uh, they're all some genetically or ethnically, you know, different groups, and they have some kind of a mixed origin or anything like that. But none of that is true. So, you know, you, you would often hear some, some trolls on the social media parroting the same funny statements like, okay, the word Rajput, you know, it didn't exist before the 13th century. Hence, the Rajputs themselves didn't exist before that time. Uh, that actually cracks me up. Because, well, guess what, the word Hindu as well, did not exist before the 6th century BCE. Should I now suggest that the Hindus didn't exist before 2,500 years in the past? So, I mean, what I'm trying to say is that just as you find culturally and genetically the same people before as well as after the first occurrence of the word Hindu, and you say that Hindus were there even before the 6th century BCE, it's just a new term that has developed somehow. And honestly, there's no evidence to doubt that. Similarly, my point is the milieu of the people identified as Kshatriyas, Rajaputras, and later Rajputs remains the same. It's the same culture, the same religion, same values, similar policies as well. Now, I'll, I'll just give, give a few examples of that to, to show that there is a continuity. One is of administrative frameworks. So in the early medieval centuries, you would find the Kshatriyas or Rajputras in the feudal order uh, governing Chaturshitikas. What is a Chaturshitik? Chaturshitik is a unit of land covering 84 villages. So you would have some Samant or some feudal uh, who would uh, govern that, uh, that unit, that land as a, as a unit uh, of 84 villages. Later, you find Rajputs governing Chaurasis. Even till date, many localities in North India are known with this term Chaurasi. Should I say that the unit of 84 villages didn't exist before the term Chaurasi? Of course not. <laughs> the same unit of 84 villages existed in similar feudal setup earlier as well with the name Chaturshitik. Right? So what changed? Just the language and hence the word, a subtle change. Now, other than the administrative framework, if you come to traditions, uh, the early medieval era, you find Kshatriya, Rajanya, or uh, Rajaputra ladies committing Sati. Okay. After the 13th century, again, you have the women of same ancestries, same clans, still committing Sati. Just the word has changed for them uh, to Rajput now. So, other than the charans to some extent, because of heavy influence of, of being with the Rajputs all the time, no medieval caste except Rajputs 
has consistently carried as a tradition the act of committing sati this i'm talking about the north so i, I won't comment about isolated cases here and there my point is about the continuity of the tradition which has been preserved in the uh, medieval era only in the rajput caste see i'm not glorifying or admonishing the tradition here my point is not even about the tradition but about there being enough continuity beneath the change of terminology and sati as a tradition is not some fashion trend that can traverse across the horizontals or verticals of the society it involves the sacrifice of life right so traditions as intense as this they propagate by blood generation to generation and consistency of a particular type of environment and upbringing that's why sati as a tradition traveled within these uh, limited lineages and that's how you can trace the history of a people using such intense traditions so the fact that sati is not only found in you know uh, post apabhrash medieval india but also many many centuries before it among the same clans and the same kshatriya people and we have inscriptional evidence of that plenty of it that tells us how confident we can be about the origin of rajputs at least much much before the touted 13th century right so in the if you come to the clans early medieval centuries you find the clan names like chahman bhatti pratihar rashtrakoot chapotkat dadhichak right now after that language shift you have the clan names as chauhan bhatti padihar rathod chavda dahiya are we going to say that since the word chauhan was you know used for the first time in the 14th century hence there were no chauhans before the 14th century now <laughs> that, that that's how retarded it sounds when when the rajput origin is questioned like this so basically it's the same people whose popular clan name was earlier a sanskrit word like chahaman and now it happens to be an upper branch of that word that's all chahaman became chauhan pratihar became padihar and so on right and uh, if if i want to reinforce this there there are ways to be double sure of this uh, so in in epigraphy if if you notice there are two plates of same date in ghatiala uh, it's a place near jodhpur they are both belonging to the same 9th century uh, king kakkuk pratihar also known as kakkus uh, pratihar so one of the plates is in sanskrit it identifies him as being of the pratihar clan okay sat pratihar jatina that's the word now the other one is in prakrit and it calls him padihar okay 9th century same guy same date two different languages two different words right outside epigraphy <clears throat> if you look in literature in 12th century ad the famous jain acharya hemachandra he writes his uh, grammar work called dvayashray mahakavi so there he what he does is he first puts in a sanskrit uh, a prakrit word a verse and then elaborates on it in sanskrit so there at one point he mentions the clan as padihar in a verse and then while elaborating on it in sanskrit he uses the word pratihar why did i take this example that seals for us that these are same clans which were operating before as well as after the word rajputra turned into rajput okay so lastly i i also want to uh, connect this uh, to the fact that these clans which i'm talking about like chauhan bhati padihar etc who are called rajputs since the linguistic changes and who are a part of the group called chatis rajwansh of rajputs so they are seen intermarrying each other before as well as after the appearance of the word rajput the same clans so they were not marrying outside this cluster of 36 clans when the term was rajputra they were not marrying outside the cluster when the term changed to rajput what does that tell us it, it tells us that so far as the people are concerned nothing changed there's no room for doubt not only the rajputs existed much before the touted 13th century ad but they are purely just a medieval continuation of the ancient kshatriyas okay so that's about the uh, origin and uh, <clears throat>
so there, there's one more insinuation which comes across that is that uh, the Rajputs have a mixed origin. So, or, or that they were not a caste, but just a class and all that. The, the, the problem with that is, uh, let's forget about the Rajput word for a moment and, and look at the, uh, so even before the medieval era began, the sixth to the seventh centuries, even before that, the word vyavastha of Hindu society was almost gone. We know that for, that for a fact. And the, the Hindu society had got a birth-based consolidated jati vyavastha. Okay, so the same words like Brahman, Kshatri, etc., were now denoting a birth-based jatis, right? So, of course, exceptions do pop up uh, every now and then, but uh, those are exceptions and not the norm. So, I'll I'll quickly list some evidence. So, two thousand five hundred years ago, you notice the 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 famous scholar Panini, uh, he defines the word Kshatriya in his. Uh, Phenomenal work, uh, Ashtadhyayi. He says, uh, for Kshatriya, Kshatrasya Patyam Kshatriya. Now, the Apatya which comes here, it means birth-based. Then come the Greek uh, scholars, Megasthenes, uh, uh, Strabo, Aryan. Uh, they say that the castes in India, they don't marry with each other. And they don't take each other's occupations. And that's quite a consolidated segregation, I would say. No loose ends, right? Then uh, you can pick the example of 7th century Chinese uh, traveler, Huen San. So he, he traveled a lot through India. So he has identified some of our kings as Kshatriya by birth. Then you can take the example of uh, 11th century Aditya Puran. It says that the intercaste marriages are completely banned in the society. The term they use is uh, Kalivarja. Kalivarja means things that are prohibited considering the influence of Kali Yuga. And in the same 11th century, you will see uh, Al-Biruni comes in, the Islamic scholar. And he repeats the same thing, that the Hindu castes, they don't intermarry and they don't share each other's occupations. Uh, later, the 12th century Jain scholar Hemachandra from modern Gujarat, he also repeats Panini in saying that Kshatriya is a jati. And he also adds that, so th this is an interesting bit. He says that those of the Kshatriyas who belong to the lineage of some royal family are known as Rajanyas. Okay. Uh, at the same time, a similar identification is made hundreds of miles away in Kashmir. So while writing his uh, famous historical text, uh, Raj Tarangini, uh, Kalhan says that there are 36 clans of Rajputras and they're so proud of their lineage that they won't leave their place even to the Surya himself. That, that's like mirroring the, uh, the, the way we know a Rajput. So these are just few examples. And with a consolidated Jati Vivastha like this, the collective Rajput identities components, at least a vast majority of them, which were also called Rajanya and Rajputra, they cannot come from outside of the birth-based Kshatriya Jati. We have seen why. So this fundamental fact is unmoved even if we discard the things like, okay, there is no divine origin, origin from epic characters like Ram, Lakshman, and Pandavas, even if we discard all of that. The Kshatriya origin of Rajputs going back deep into the ancient era still stands on a solid base, right? And um, so my, my understanding about these terms like Suryavanshi and Chandravanshi is that... Uh, uh, these there were some branches of Kshatriyas and the the calendars that they used to follow. Uh, one branch would follow a solar calendar and another would follow a lunar solar, solar calendar, and that's how they came to be known as Suryavanshi and Chandravanshi. That's one theory about them. But in, in any case, that that's not very consequential for us uh, toward the uh, origin debate. But uh, yeah, so I, I would say that it's not. Uh, possible to guarantee that every single person ever identified as a Rajput in history has been a hundred percent pure Suryavanshi or Chandravanshi Kshatriya, you know, but we can say that with certainty uh, that such was indeed the case for vast majority of the medieval Rajputs. It's like how we know that uh, there was no major influx, you know, like a so-called Aryan invasion or migration to have happened in India, but yes, 
at some point, some people in small numbers could have come into India, got absorbed, adopted the culture, and are now practically indistinguishable in that population, right? So those kind of ins inconsequential blips, uh, they don't change the core facts of history, right? So the same way, there may be a minuscule external input in the medieval Rajput stock. I'm not sure of even that, but even if I assume so, that doesn't, uh, that, that, that it doesn't change the entire characteristic ancestry, the overwhelmingly Kshatriya lineage of Rajputs. So, we, and moreover, if I were to think that, uh, okay, the ancient Kshatriyas and Rajputs have some kind of a disconnect, the Rajputs were implanted later, they came in from outside later. Tell me, how is it that, uh, you know, we have had no selective epidemics, right, which would attack and wipe out only the existing Kshatriyas and create a vacuum for someone else to come and fill in. Nothing of that sort happened. What I'm trying to say is that if you say that, okay, Rajputs have come in from outside, what happened to the existing Kshatriyas? So just as we say that the present day Brahmins are descendants of the ancient era Brahmins, what's the problem in saying that Rajputs are the descendants of the ancient Kshatriyas, right? So there are people who like to turn a mole into a hill for sake of propaganda. And these um, these fabrications on the origin of Rajputs, they, to my mind, they're actually a red herring. Red herring because this is done to distract from a fact that uh, there is a bogey of Samantwad raised over the mainstream ever since the early 20th century. And it has been in constant use to continue disenfranchising the Kshatriyas of our society. And they've thrown everything at it, academia, Bollywood, the so-called subaltern politics. So that, that con constant propaganda is, is something nobody is paying attention to. What so, exactly is this uh, Samantwad? What, is, what do you mean by that? <clears throat> it's just a, a, a negative portrayal that, uh, you know, the Rajputs used to <clears throat> commit a lot of excesses. They gobbled up all the power. They overused their resources. They <clears throat> sort of uh, suppressed the lower strata of the society. Uh, they were in cahoots with the invaders. And basically, the accessing and, you know, uh, what do you call it, uh, Zalim, Zalim Samant kind of a thing. It's just a, a, a stereotype which has been amplified using some literature and uh, the themes of Bollywood, where but you would isn't typically this... have a, a Thakur villain yeah. and things like that. Yeah. <clears throat> isn't this the same thing they are doing with the Brahmins? They are trying to demonize the Brahmins and portray them as the oppressors of society. They are the ones who impose the caste system and they are the ones who disenfranchise the so-called lower castes. It's the same thing that I'm seeing, isn't it? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So this is basically um, what I'm trying to say here is, see, the, the Hindu society, we have a lot of inbuilt diversity and stratification. And it is not something which has been imposed by force because it has been going on for thousands of years. It is organic within us. If it has changed or evolved, again, it has happened organically, not with some kind of external force. So if someone has to manipulate a society as diverse and stratified as the Hindu society, the, the society of uh, Sanatani Aryas, what they would have to do is the one way is to pit one side against another. Another is to, you know, uh, basically homogenize that society. Because see, what happens is, uh, even if you uh, look at the example of missionaries, the difficulties that they faced was like, every 50 houses are worshipping a different deity. You go 50 houses away, the deity also changes. Okay, they are worshipping this Kul Devta, they are worshipping this. They were like, how many are we going to catch and how, how many are we going to, you know, demonize or, or overcome? There are so many gods, so many traditions and all. So it's like it's in the air. They couldn't handle. The same is the problem with the people who want to control the society. So they want to kill this diversity, this stratification and homogenize it. The reason being, once you've homogenized it, it's like a herd of sheep, right? 
so that way they try to control to control the society they try to homogenize it and in order to homogenize it what they are trying to do is whoever is seen as the upper uh, or a better placed strata of the society you have to demolish that and then you basically brainwash the other strata that okay you are lower strata you have been abused you are left out you should do something to come up and then you tell them that okay you take this particular history you take this particular historic uh, famous personality he is yours he is of your caste you start claiming him you start claiming this particular heritage you start doing this and i, I would find parallels to it with ayurveda and yoga like many times you know they would say okay yoga is not hindu or the yoga is not just uh, indian or uh, the, the, so maybe not exactly but that's how i you know articulate or understand it it, it uh, kind of a parallel so yeah that's how i understand what what's happening to the society yeah one thing that i find really curious is that in the past 70 years plus of india's history since our so called independence mm. our historians have absolutely neglected rajput history right i mean there are so many interesting dynasties and uh, conflicts and tales among the rajputs and yet there is absolutely no research that's been done about them there's there are no books written about the rajputs it's, it's astonishing that there are no modern books about the rajputs despite there being such a rich history among the rajputs and i feel that it's just to, for the sake of marginalizing the rajputs and to kind of erase their history because all the glory all the valor of india came from the deeds of these the uh, 36 uh, clans like you say so uh, is has it always been just 36 clans or have have there been more uh, how has it been right so the the background of this comes in the uh, sorry in the revival of uh, hindu dharma uh, so right after the arab attacks happened in the early 8th century um, we we see the uh, arrival of adi shankaracharya and uh, kumarilal bhatt so basically his work uh, at that time it uh, dealt a death blow of sorts to the already receding a uh, buddhist influence and uh, with that revival of hindu dharma and it's not just that there, there were a couple of other reasons like uh, the kind of psychological shocks which the hun and arab invasions sent into the society the gradual development of feudal system and all so there were a lot of it was a whole cocktail of factors which made the importance of birth and clan you know it supersede a lot of other things so that's the background in which this concept of 36 clans seems to have developed because if if you look at uh, one of the uh, islamic histories i think it was uh, uh, ibn khurdadbi he was the first one to notice this uh, difference uh, which i also uh, you know mentioned with an example of rajanya he says that there are uh, when is uh, giving the strata of the society he i think came in 9th century so he is saying there are shuddha kshatriyas and there are kshatriyas there are two kinds of kshatriyas for for the ones who have some kind of royal lineage i think he has used the term shuddha kshatriyas and then the rest are who are just occupational kshatriyas uh, they are kshatriyas so i think that after the revival of hindu dharma after adi shankara acharya the clans who had some kind of a royal pedigree in the recent past or currently who were able to prove some kind of genealogy and gotrachar and all of that they were basically collated and identified as okay these are the authentic clans who have a history of protecting us who have been doing so they have a genealogy and gotrachar they are thorough hindus and so that kind of a branding took place and so that 36 clan list was uh, then first time it was mentioned in kashmir and since it has been mentioned in kashmir which is a a bit of a you know a far flung area one can easily surmise that it was prevalent in the mainland north india as well at that time or even before it and then yes of course with time because 
old clans go new clans come in keeps happening a geography wise in one geography one clan is there in other geography it's not there it's absent so accordingly uh, at different times or geographies these lists uh, would have a bit of uh, a bit different composition like you would see some clan name is there in one list a few centuries down the line it's not there in another list or in another geography's list it won't be there so that, that that kind of variation happens but broadly yes you will see a lot of clan names carrying you know commonly th throughout those lists so there is a list found in prithviraj raso there is a list found in uh, uh, kumarpal uh, prabhand and uh, raj tarangani doesn't provide a list it just says that there are 36 clans there is a list found in uh, vastu ratnakosh or something like that i'm forgetting the name of the, the text so yeah continuously you will see multiple lists have been given yeah now if we uh, if we study various textbooks indian history textbooks for instance uh, rc majumdar or whatever else even good writers this speculation typically is that the origins of Rajputs are not quite known. They may be most likely of outside origin, either Indo-Greeks or Scythians or Kushans or Huns, Indo-Sassanians or even Gurjars, whatever that is. So what exactly is the origin? Do some Rajputs, like you just mentioned a while ago, do some of them have some foreign origin or, or are they mostly descendants of the ancient Kshatriya clans that have been present in India since the Vedic age? Sure. Yeah, I, I would reiterate that most uh, overwhelmingly, you know, overwhelming majority of them is of the ancient Kshatriya lineage only. And there is no reason to actually believe otherwise, because there is no evidence to suggest otherwise. And, uh, you know, uh, so far as these scholars who seem to have, you know, given different theories or suggested otherwise, uh, I would say not everybody was inspired uh, by some kind of propaganda. What happens is that at, at different times, different narratives are popular and the condition of research or, uh, you know, the, those or political situations are different. So there may be some reasons due to which, uh, and then there is that tendency that, okay, a lot of scholars around me are saying this thing, so if I have to talk about this topic, I will use this line of, uh, you know, uh, narrative and they basically adopt it. So that's how it has happened. Like the early 12th, 20th century Indian scholars, they did not go hammer and tongs against the Aryan invasion theory. So they were just going with the grain, right? And they, uh, of course, the, the kind of research which was happening around this at that time was not, you know, at par with how much has been done in the past few decades. So yeah, those are the reasons. And, uh, and then of course, after the independence, the academia was clearly hijacked by, by our left wing friends. So they had their own uh, purposes to, to, you know, cater to. So because the, the left, what it believes in is that uh, they, they want to recreate the whole society in their own uh, utopian kind of an image. And to recreate something, you have to demolish what is existing. That's the reason they keep on targeting history and they keep on targeting the existing strata of the society. But then when the right wing comes into ascension, uh, they begin to distort the picture for a different reason. They, they basically start uh, distributing history like it was some kind of toffee or candy. Okay, you take this this particular, uh, you know, uh, historic personality. He, Mehir Bhoj is yours or Anandpal Tomar is yours. Prithviraj Chauhan is yours. Th that kind of uh, the thing is happening, which is not uh, expected, at least from the right wing. Yeah. Now, are the Rajputs purely a North Indian phenomenon or have there been Rajputs in Southern India as well? I mean, that's an interesting question. What do you think? Uh, yeah, I, I did try to search, but um, I haven't found Rajputs uh, as a society or any kind of, you know, uh, a condensed uh, group formation uh, in the South. And uh, I, I think there are plenty of reasons for that. The, the way the politics of North changed uh, with, with the attacks, the Hunas, the Arabs, then the Turks and all, 
I, I would say the North was uh, bearing the brunt of all of that uh, more than the South, uh, before the South at least. And uh, so that kind of uh, changes a lot and it, it adds or contributes to the environment as to why this, uh, this evolution or, or change of terms happens in the North more than the, uh, the South. But um, the, there is a bit of uh, tradition even in the ancient era. If you look at the uh, literature of Panini, even he has mentioned a lot of clans living in the northwestern belt of India, and he identifies them as Ayudhajivin. And uh, I think uh, Janaki has also written about that, Shastra Jivin or something. So those clans are all uh, straddled along the belt of uh, Kashmir to Gujarat. Okay, This whole northwest, northwestern belt of India, you have various clans like Rajanya clan, there is Yodhe, uh, there, there is uh, uh, Arjunayan and... Uh, and I think I'm forgetting a couple other names. So, so, so there, there were a lot of uh, clans like that, Udumbar and uh, some, some other clans. And uh, coincidentally, the, the, the mentions of uh, 36 Rajvanshas also mostly come from Kashmir and Gujarat, that whole northwestern belt. So I, I think there is there is a lot of continuity there as well. Yeah. Now, uh, is there any connection between the great Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj and the Rajputs? I mean, it is claimed that he also was a, himself a descendant of a Rajput lineage. So could you throw some light on that? Yeah, see, um, <clears throat> for someone who would really demand evidence, uh, clear-cut evidence or best possible evidence for everything, like <clears throat> some of our folks were demanding, okay, give us the evidence of surgical strike. Where is the video recording or all of that? See, it's not possible to, to you know, really convince to that degree that Shivaji was a Rajput because when you go to history, the data is uh, more often than not sketchy. So the best we can do is look at the available evidence, analyze and form a best possible uh, assertion or theory that, okay, this is how it has happened. It, to think that you can do anything beyond that is is uh, not wise. So my, my theory or my stand around it is, I am convinced that he was of a Rajput lineage. Um, but if you ask me like, okay, provide some kind of irrefutable evidence that, that way, it, it's tough because our history is complex for the reason that it is human history. It would be as complex as human life is. It would have those glitches and those issues which human life has. If a clan or a family has migrated, gone through some kind of uh, uh, isolation phase or you know, basically ups and downs, you can take it for granted that their genealogical knowledge or those records would be broken, right? So those kind of, uh, that kind of haziness or ambiguity is there when you talk about the uh, ancestry of Shivaji, but there are plenty of indications to be sure about it. And uh, my point is that instead of proving that he was genealogically a Rajput, What's more important for me is that how would the contemporaries of Shivaji looking at him? I'll, I'll give just two examples here. There is a lot of other evidence as well. When Shivaji was in captivity at Agra, in, in, under the uh, captivity of uh, Mughals, uh, his uh, innermost cordon around him was of Rajput soldiers, the Kachwahas. Then there were uh, Mina soldiers and then the outermost cordon was of uh, Mughals. There were easily hundreds, or, if not thousands, I think thousands of soldiers uh, uh, around him. So um, the one incident has been reported where in third person, someone, someone was telling uh, one of the officers, um, this is basically contemporary uh, letters of uh, Dingal, which were flowing between the Kachwaha officers posted in Agra at that time when Shivaji was visiting uh, Aurangzeb era. And uh, the Divan of Amir, uh, 
Kalyan Das Singh bhi, uh, he was like a prime minister of Amir Kingdom because Mirza Raja, Jai Singh and Ram Singh ji, they used to either be in Agra or some far flung mil military campaign. So those letters are uh, not only contemporary, they not only overlap by time and place, they are basically, uh, they're not Mughal literature that they would have some kind of uh, official bias. They are not Southern literature that they would have some kind of a Shivaji bias or Maratha bias. They're straddling in between. Th that is Rajput official correspondence. So reasonably neutral as well. Now these officers who are having some chit chat, they say that uh, we, we saw Shivaji up close. And, uh, you know, some of them even met him or uh, and all of that. So one of them praises that he is a, a very, uh, you know, Kharohi Bhalo Rajput. That's the line which comes. It's like uh, he's an authentic, a good, genuine Rajput. And I found him just as I heard of, I had heard about him. And then the conversation veers towards, okay, why don't we, you know, try to help him? And he's uh, unfortunately in captivity here and all of that. But what was important for me there was people who were, see, you know, who had seen Shivaji up close, his contemporaries who were there at that time, people of Rajput lineage had called him a good genuine Rajput. The second example is, uh, there was this uh, royal astrologer. At that time, what, what used to happen was every king or kingdom would have a royal astrologer. So these royal astrologers, they would typically intermingle with a lot of royalty. right? So the Jodhpur states or the Marwad states royal astrologer, I'm forgetting his name, uh, he uh, used to mix with royalty as well. And frequently he would keep receiving horoscopes of VIPs. Royalty of all kinds, maybe some Mughal noble, maybe some Rajput noble, and likewise. So uh, he, what they used to do is they keep on compiling all those horoscopes which they receive, and they would document that okay, this is the horoscope of this VIP, this VIP, this VIP. So in his Gutka, in his compilation, uh, he was again a, a con contemporary of Shivaji. In his compilation, he has uh, put up a section of. Uh, the royals of uh, Mewad, okay, and then uh, along with the uh, Mewad royals, he has provided the horoscope of Shivaji. Okay, so this way you can uh, basically what I'm trying to say is his contemporaries, people who knew him, people who were there at at, at the time, they clearly considered him a Rajput. I think more than doing DNA and blood tests, we should be appreciative of that fact. Right. Yeah. Right. So you mentioned that uh, they refer to Shivaji as a Kharo Balo Rajput, a true blue, genuine Rajput. So exactly. my question is what, yeah. So my question is what makes a true blue Rajput? What are the characteristics of a good Rajput or the, the values that a Rajput would have lived by? Right. The, the ethos are basically more or less the same as the ones with which a Kshatriya would uh, live by. Uh, broadly, the term that you can use is Kshatri Dharam. It's the same difference which exists between a soldier and a goon. Basically, anybody can stand with a weapon and fire, right? But everybody who has a weapon and fires is not called a soldier. Right. There is a difference. The difference is of culture, of ethos, of principles that you follow. So when you come to Rajputs, the ethos were mostly around uh, being a protector, just as a soldier today is. The term that was used back then was Gau uh, Brahman Pratipalak. So their ethos were around uh, setting the highest standards of conduct behavior as well as being the protectors and honor of course had a lot of importance the sense of pride was highly developed okay and uh, yeah of course 
bravery was a was a was a given obviously so those are some of the characteristics by which you can uh, you know uh, identify a rajput yeah there is something <clears throat> in japan they used to have a class called the samurai who were uh, warriors by birth warriors by blood and they had this code of conduct called bushido bushido is the code of conduct that you live by and you died by so i kind of it it it's very similar in a sense to the code of conduct that the rajputs would have there was no written code of conduct in the case of the rajputs but it's very similar to the way the samurai conducted themselves i mean for them their honor was more important than their life and they had this practice called seppuku or harakari in case uh, harakiri in case their yeah. their uh, their honor was offended in any way because of their own conduct they would take their life in that ritualistic manner so yeah. it kind of reminds me of that and one of the most important uh, things in that is uh, respect towards women i think that is one yes. of the great characteristics of rajputs the uh, you would never ever find a rajput disrespecting a woman right yes yes that's true and so, that's yeah please go ahead. yeah I, i was just going to say that um It, it, because you mentioned that it's not written uh, i think yeah that's a problem which uh, you know kind of uh, propagates throughout our society not just in rajputs we haven't had a good writing tradition uh, throughout like you know for a lot of things uh, it used to transmit generation to generation on a verbal mode and even when we used to write things the the approach was not like okay i have to write, write some history in a systematic manner to protect knowledge so th- those kind of problems were there yeah uh, i think it's you know, i issue. yeah i have a different thesis to this like we know that we had these so many of these great universities throughout our country which uh, dotted mm-hmm. the length and the breadth of the country we had mahaviharas we had great universities nalanda takshashila vikramshila odantapuri telhara so many uh, sharda peet and each and every one of these universities was destroyed every library was burned down the, the nalanda library is supposed to have burned burned for months now obviously it's books and records that that burned in there so maybe right. we did have all of this but it was all destroyed that is also a very strong possibility you know would you agree no not only destroy i completely agree with that yes uh, that was a big jolt uh, but it again indicates that uh, knowledge traditions were a bit more than uh, more centralized than you would typically want them to be But i agree because yes. it, yeah because it, it's like sort of a weak link that okay if the library is gone uh, the knowledge tradition is gone so yeah it, it did uh, deal a jolt to us but uh, then i would say that knowledge was not destroyed because since our society was stratified and there was a clear segregation of uh, Uh, you know occupations and uh, knowledge systems or skill sets so knowledge did transmit but generation to generation right and that eventually led to basically being uh, knowledge being in silos okay when knowledge is in silos that's when you know it uh, it becomes even more vulnerable to destruction or uh, vanishing so you can uh, basically draw a parallel with the example okay i will again give a military example uh, subukt again he was fighting the shahis uh, in the battle of uh, lagman uh, around uh, the end of 10th century if i'm not wrong the tactics that subukt again applied dirty tactics to defeat the shahis the same tactics mohammed shahabuddin ghori applied two centuries later in the second battle of the rhine my point is if they could do why couldn't we so we didn't have a an institutional framework which would not only document the uh, the the data as well as experiences of our interactions with these militias you know in terms of okay what did they do what was the impact uh, what did we do to counter them what worked what didn't what is this doctrine of islam what is the ideology or theology which is working behind these powers these forces that study either it didn't take place 
or it was living in silos which got destroyed in isolation there was no institutional framework which would transmit it not only document it save it but transmit it to people who are supposed to receive it and take those lessons and maybe you know uh, fight better or use them better so yeah those those kind of problems existed yeah well that brings me kind of to the present day i mean just let me let me take a diversion that because even today in india we don't have military universities and colleges i i think right. we may have an ima here and there but it doesn't really uh study all of this and and uh, disseminate the information and and the tactics strategies lessons from the past 1000 years of indian history because that's what we need we we need to teach our officers these bigger concepts and lessons and meld all all of that with strategy tactics doctrine and all that i don't think we have that even today and if you look at right. the, the countries like the us and china they have military uh, universities and colleges in which these things are taught as a as one of the core fundamental courses so i think yes. they still haven't learned the lessons isn't it yeah uh, we we haven't but i i would say there is uh, some movement on that front i forget the name of that university but i think some some university is being set up uh, i see shastra university or something i sorry if i got the name wrong i completely at loss about the name but i i, I think there is one such university either being set up or it would have been set up by now but one such uh, you know work was was going on yes uh, under this government only the current thing is well on. well if, well I, that is very enthusing i am very happy to hear that but it's something that should have been done 70 years ago you know exactly. in, uh, and and you need military researchers as well not just instructors who will stand and deliver lectures right. we don't right. have any of that happening in this country you know which is uh, See, very disappointing yeah our, our prime minister was, was not even interested in having an army uh, forget about having science <laughs> <or> universities <laughs> <clears throat> yeah yeah i know now one of the things about rajputs like i mentioned like you also agreed that is that they have the highest respect for women the utmost respect for women you could not imagine a rajput disrespecting a woman of any any portion of society in any way whatsoever now that is interesting because it is also alleged about the rajputs that they used to drown their daughters in milk so is this a fact or is this a lie sure um i won't say it's a fact uh, or a lie uh, let me put things in perspective okay. because again it, it's never black or white it's it's almost always gray so one of the worst things that that has happened in mixing sociology with history is uh, doing extrapolations and generalization that's the worst part of it so female infanticide uh, infanticide uh, that, that that's the uh, the term i think so this yes. is uh, uh it's one of those cases and to to, to talk about female infanticide in case of rajputs i i would start with marriages now marriage in india is uh, and especially has been an organ of social status for both sides but more so for the girls family so in medieval times the girls family would always try to marry upward in the social strata as as a means to raise their own status and network <clears throat> sorry so uh, yeah nothing inherently bad with doing that but um, the the uh, and yes the the tradition of hypergamy like that that was a good excuse to keep going with it because you know one man can have many wives so that thing it helped with it uh, propagating it so now we know that uh, there is a pyramid hierarchy right it always turns narrow toward the top right uh, so a caste or a clan uh, in that hierarchy which is already up high in, in that pyramid hierarchy they are anyway short of options to <clears throat> to marry upward right if they also happen to have a lot of daughters whom they have to marry it gets even worse so that is where female infanticide began in the higher strata of our society and gradually the dowry also you know kind of got uh, consolidated or fixated and it became a marker of 
status for the girl's family and it added further more financial strain to their uh, prospects so later when the, the the rajputs toward the late medieval centuries they start losing financial resources for various reasons i'll, I'll not get into that here but uh, with that the reasons for female infanticide within the rajputs became more financial than social so yes it should have been been my opening statement it did exist but i'm just providing the context and perspective here so, so how it, widespread was this practice right um <clears throat> i won't say like you know every house or everywhere it was happening i'll i'll come to that why that's not the case uh, but before that this practice um is not limited to rajputs so the female infanticide has it's not just an issue of national prevalence for india it has rather been a global phenomena uh, and historically there have been cases in china japan and uk just to name a few countries so the occurrence of female infanticide uh, let's not go global in indian society uh, if you look at the lower strata there as well the female infanticide happens and it is again connected more to finances of the girls upbringing the, the wedding the dowry and all of that more more of this than anything else but these layers of the society also had a compensating factor and that was that their women were exposed to labor so the women folk were active resources of financial well-being for the family and if you're in the lower strata that's a huge huge plus so this in a way controlled the percentage of infanticide cases in lower strata not saying that it didn't happen it happened it happened a lot but compared to the percentage in the higher strata like rajputs it i would say it was a bit lower so i don't have the exact percentage or there is no way to know but yeah the, it did happen with with a frequency among the rajputs yes now the proliferation of this thing within the rajputs when has it occurred that's another context the context of timeline this has mostly occurred around the 18th century why only 18th century because that's when there was widespread political and financial reversals for the rajput clans which uh, basically stiffened the attachment to social pride and the attitude towards it another reason why i stick to the 18th century only is that our historical sources before the british of the 19th century uh, by that i mean local as well as the foreign traveler uh, accounts before 19th century they don't tell us much about female infanticide among the uh, strata of the society e- even if you read the documentation of the british from the 19th century it doesn't prove that the practice dates back more than one or two centuries before the british rule began so it doesn't go back a lot of centuries in the past at least not with a, a potent frequency of cases because so, see because if if it had happened that way that there was a decent frequency of female infanticide amongst rajputs even many many centuries before the british or the 18th century that documentation medieval literature would have caught it up somewhere or the other right so that's not the case so if you to summarize it this was a basically a global phenomena which did proliferate in india in the late medieval centuries and it has spread to different layers of the social uh, you know social strata for different reasons the reasons broadly being related to social hierarchy the psychology of pride and the economics of raising a girl child marriage dowry and all of that yeah all right <clears throat> there's one thing i see these days on social media which is this uh, controversy about rajputs and gurjars what exactly <laughs> is this i i have never been able to wrap my head around it but could you please explain what's going on and what it is about sure thing sure thing so uh, honestly the, this uh, controversy has nothing to do with history at least that much i can tell to to begin with it it's just a, a socio political propaganda 
of course, with backing from political parties. The way I understand its root cause is the need hierarchy. So once you're done fulfilling the basic needs for survival, what you do is you run after luxuries, that extra cushion of comfort and security. When you've got that sorted as well, then you gun for glory. Okay. Now, one way is to rise high, aim high, and do big things. That's the authentic way of going about it. Another way is a cheap shortcut. And that is to appropriate someone else's, uh, else's glory or someone else's identity and you claim it for yourself, right? And a lot of us know such processes already uh, with the name digestion, which is popularized by that, uh, that book of Sri Rajiv Malhotra, Malhotra. So yeah, and again, I, I see parallels to it with what is happening with the uh, brand of yoga and Ayurveda. So, what has happened in this particular case, which you're talking about the Gujar controversy, Gujar controversy, is that uh, some people started claiming the sublime history for themselves, identity appropriation. They claim for almost every well-known historic personality to have been of Gujar ancestry. Uh, Mehir Bhoj, Pratihar, and uh, Prithviraj Chauhan, these are just few examples, just the most popular examples. Their claims are nearly on all of the Rajput clans. So I'll uh, today I'll not get into the details of why each of these numerous uh, famous kings and clans uh, of our history, why they didn't belong to the Gujar caste. I've actually already done 12 videos having roughly 10 hours of content so far to cover this very topic in detail. But what I can tell our viewers here is that the, the crux of this whole debate lies in the answer of one question. And uh, okay, before coming to the question, let me um, uh, give you three entities here, which will help understand. There is a region named Gurjaratra or Gurjar Desh, Gurjar Bhumi, it has been called variously, derivatives of the word Gurjar. So it is identified roughly as the contiguous area of South Rajasthan to North Gujarat, okay, that area. Now, the second is uh, that the word Gurjar has also been used for people and kings in various inscriptions and liter literature, literary sources. The third being, there is a pastoral herdsman caste named Gujar. Okay. So coming back to the question, the question is, did some people called Gurjar name the place after themselves as Gurjar Desh? Or was it that the place was already named as Gurjar Desh and then accordingly all of its natives and residents were called Gurjar, right? That's the question. What is the flow? Which way is it flowing? The short answer is that the place had the name Gurjar Desh already and from that geographic identity, its residents were called Gurjar. And that was the norm of that age. It's not just a particular case about Gurjar Desh or Gurjar Atra, that was the norm of that age. The residents of Lat Desh, Marudesh, Sindhu Desh, Kosal, Kaling, Karnat, etc., they were all known by their region. It was a widespread practice of picking geographic cognomen. And uh, okay, then the boundaries of this Gurjar Desh, they have changed throughout the history. And uh, Again, the, there is nothing exceptional about it, just as any other region or kingdom's boundaries would change throughout the history based on the fortunes of the political power that governs it. Even if you take a modern example, uh, imagining that, okay, the United States of America, it uh, basically gets some new landmass contiguous to its borders. Uh, basically, they acquire new land by force or by peace, whatever you want to imagine. Now, 150 years down the line, if I would go in that area, stand there, I would say that I'm sitting in United States of America, right? So that way, the geographic connotation or the region uh, known as United States of America has expanded. Later, it might contract. The same thing has happened over and over again throughout our history through the various kingdoms and regions. Right? 
hey, it is nothing peculiar or out of the blue. There is, you know, a absolutely ordinary thing. It happens all the time. So, for most of the time, the core Gurjar Desh was uh, this only, the South Rajasthan and uh, North Gujarat. Now, the people running this propaganda, what they do is, they try to obfuscate that the Gurjar people of medieval history are the same as the Gujar caste of pastoral herdsmen. The fact is, and this is important, throughout the Indian history, there is not even a single mention of the word Gurjar with the connotation of a caste or tribe. Starting from the first mention of the word Gurjar, which occurs in the pre-medieval Panchatantra, where uh, a poor charioteer, he goes to Gurjar Desh to buy some camels. So right from there up to the end, the, the connotation of the word Gurjar is always either the region, the country, with its name Gurjar Desh, or for all the inhabitants of the region belonging to various ancestries and occupations. So they have been called Gurjar, obviously due to having residence there, like a citizen of America would be called uh, an American. So that's why we find in medieval times, uh, you will find Gurjar Baniyas, Gurjar Brahmins, Gurjar Jain, Gurjar Suthar, Gurjar Kavi, Gurjar Acharya, Gurjar Bhikshuk, Gurjar soldiers, Gurjar farmers, and so on, right? So, and um, it, it's not just the absence of caste tribe connotation for this word. The, the flow of Gurjar identity going from place to people, it gets positive confirmation in clear statements to that effect in the medieval texts. I'll just give two examples. Uh, Abhay Tilak Gani was a Jain scholar in Gurjar Desh. So him, his ancestors, his literary tradition were all living and breathing Gurjar Desh. Okay. That means the best authority on this issue. And by the way, he's writing soon after Prithviraj Chauhan. So in his commentary on the famous uh, Dvayashre Mahakavya of Acharya Hemachandra, Abhay Tilak Gani comes to elaborate on a word Gurjaranam. Okay. Now, uh, the, the literal meaning of uh, uh, Gurjaranam is Gurjar people, right? It's like saying Americans, so American people. So, who are the Gurjar people? So, for that, Abhay Tilak Gani says for Gurjaranam, Gurjar Deshodbhava Nanam. I, I'll repeat, it is Gurjar Deshodbhava Nanam, meaning <clears throat> The people who are born in Gurjar Desh, who are natives of Gurjar Desh, they are called Gurjar. Are we going to say that a contemporary like Abhay Tilak Gani, with all the knowledge, tradition, and background behind him living in Gurjar Desh, didn't know what Gurjar meant, and some 21st century trolls would know better than him? Second example. So then there is a Shabd Kalpadrum. Uh, this text in turn cites the Shabd Ratnavali from Aurangzeb's time. It defines the uh, Gurjar word as the country which suppresses its enemies. It's, it goes Shatrukrata Tadanam Badodhyamadikam Va Ujjarayati Yo Deshah. And accordingly, then it says that its residents, uh, the men and women, they are called Gurjar and Gurjari. And then it goes on to define their qualities. It, it, for men, it says, Kalinga sahasika itivad deshastha jane lakshaneti geyam, meaning the male residents of Gurjar Desh, the Gurjars, are clever and brave. Okay. And then the word for women is Gurjar Desh Vasini. And then it says, Ato Gurjari iti kechit. Ato means hence or therefore. So because the residence is in Gurjar Desh, because she is Gurjar Desh Vasini, hence she is called Gurjari. So that's about the commoners. Then I just have to touch on the kings. After commoners, we are left with kings because some inscriptions have the uh, Gurjar word and its derivatives used for kings. So what you'll find is that whoever rules the Gurjar Desh, 
would take a title like gurjar adhiraj gurjar nareesh etc okay just as a king of lat region he used to call himself lateshwar the king of ajmer the chauhan kingdom used to call himself sapadalakshishwar because his kingdom the geographic area was uh, called sapadalaksh sapadalaksh is uh, 1.25 lakhs sawalak so it, it was like a, a region of 1.25 lakh villages and so it is called sapadalaksh so then there is the example of a, a 10th century southern king of the gang dynasty from somewhere around mysore and bangalore he was named uh, i think mar singh so he wins the gurjar desh in in battle and then he calls himself gurjar adhiraj then then 13th century onwards you have numerous muslim rulers of gurjar desh right like uh, the first example i can give is of alp khan he was the brother in law of alauddin khilji so he is seen having gurjar titles and then there were various uh, you know Guj- gujarat sultanate sultans and all of them they have taken similar gurjar titles so this term is cutting across ancestries and religions just because a king takes the gurjar title doesn't mean that gurjar is his ancestry and like i said the word gurjar has never been an ancestry and um, so it, it's a geography and the application to a person is due to his or her association with the geography like living in it or conquering it so lastly if you for a moment imagine that okay maybe the later rulers were not gurjar by ancestry you know the sadans the the muslims but by that time the place had adopted the name given to it by earlier rulers who would be gurjar by ancestry okay that that supposition the problem with that possibility is firstly how do you identify then who are gurjar and who are not because we are conceding that the word used as title alone is incapable of determining secondly there is this tribal zeal of medieval era what used to happen was when a people conquer a place uh, in in the medieval era if they find that the place is named after some other ancestry or ethnicity like gurjar that has been defeated they would invariably rename the place to something else why would you tolerate that i mean it, it's medieval era so maybe with the name of their own caste clan tribe whatever it is they would rename yet nothing of that sort happens with gurjar desh the place name remains constant throughout all the various ancestries and religions that have come to rule it that's possible in only one case that the original contributor of the word gurjar was not a particular ancestry but a constant factor like geography it was the geography gurjar was a geography which is why none of these diverse political powers ruling gurjar desh throughout the history ever felt the need to change the name right so that's about gurjar so far as the gujar jati is concerned it is only in the 16th century babar nama that we first encounter the word gujar used for a jati and even there it is gujar not gurjar then this is quickly followed by jahangir nama and both these biographies portray the same profile for gujars a pastoral herdsman occupation involved in dairy products they they also refer to some looting practices and all I, i'm not going to get into that later the uh, british gazetteers they document what the ancestors of present day gujars have themselves said about their origins so many of them have claimed a, a, a rajput male and a gujari woman's wedlock as the origin of their lineages different branches of gujars uh, have given different names as the rajput male ancestor but the pattern holds a rajput man and a gujari woman it's it's uh, anulom vivah basically so to this the uh, usual and shallow comeback that i hear on social media is uh, no our our history has been distorted by these invaders but then even the internal sources of gujar history echo the same thing 
for example if you if you pick uh, one source dev narayan ki phad so the phad is a tradition where a story is depicted by pictures and it is sung to people by bhopas who are the storytellers so dev narayan ki phad it documents the entities of uh, quasi historic as well as religious importance for the gujars so they even worship its uh, protagonists like uh, dev narayan ji so dev narayan ji belonged to the bagdavat branch of chauhans now the phad says that the progenitor of this uh, bagdavat branch was a person named bag ji and he had the face of a tiger which is bag in hindi and the torso of a human so he was born from a chauhan father and a brahmin mother and then bag ji eventually had uh, 12 wives belonging to the upper castes from them he had 24 sons so the, fir- the these are the first bagdavats so a few years later the local king there he was fearing that these guys are going to give me a challenge to my rule uh, the the sons of bag ji so he gets the sons married to gujars thinking that this way their occupation their lifestyle and position in the social strata would change and so no more challenges for me so that that happened and then one of the the sons uh, on these sons who married the gujar women one of them was bhoj ji and his wife was sadhu and their son was dev narayan ji who is worshiped a lot among the gujars so there is this uh, there is a reason why i narrated all this is that there is a mixed origin theme running through the phad starting from the parents of bag ji being rajput brahmin and further down the mix, the the mixed progeny is again wed into gujj women right so according to the the phad the male side meaning the bagdavats they continue identifying themselves as rajputs clearly and on more than one occasions within the phad and their women are identified as gujars right so that's about the internal uh, gujar uh, sources then you come to demography the gujar jati's population in the regions known as gurjar desh has traditionally been negligible close to zero which means that there is it's almost impossible to have an ancient you know some kind of a link or anything like that and then Uh, quite interestingly it is only in the 20th century that the people of gujar jati started using gurjar instead of gujar as their surname so there has been a change and why this change has happened i think the reasons would not now be clear to anybody who has been following this controversy so yeah the the, the seeds of this shift were in the um, early 20th century sanskritization movements which which uh, began around the time when uh, arya samaj was operating and uh, actively aiding uh, these these things so that's the crux of this uh, fake controversy it's like it's a shortcut to social ascendancy but unfortunately trying to do it by appropriating history so yeah right <clears throat> very interesting very interesting so one final question for today uh, it's about uh, maharaj jayachandra mm-hmm. gadwal so he is alleged to have been a great traitor uh, the the term jayachand is used for traitor nowadays so what is the truth behind this right yeah that that's a very painful part and actually thankfully there is now some some movement on social media uh, satisfying very satisfying for me personally that you know th- there is a movement toward correction on this blunderous myth at least in the in the mainstream or social media so the, the blunderous myth is that uh, maharaja jayachandra had called gauri shahabuddin gauri to india to settle his scores with prithviraj chauhan so hence he was a traitor if you look at the profile of maharaja jayachandra and his lineage of gaharwals you would see a picture of stout and successful resistance against the muslim invaders not one of alliance or collusion so i'll i'll start with the uh, examples like there is this uh, sarnath inscription near varanasi 
and on the Muslim side there is Tabqat e Nasiri. Both these sources, if you combine their narrative, the conclusion is that after the raids of Mahmud of Ghazni, the plains uh, east and north of Ganga, they were largely protected from Islamic attacks. There may be one or two occasions which have been documented, but nothing beyond that. So uh, with that, there is uh, there is one more inscription from Etawa. It says that uh, Govind Chandra Gahadwal, uh, he was one of the uh, prominent kings of Gahadwals. His uh, aggressive cavalry posture had forced the uh, Muslim ruler to pause and drop his plans of invasion. Then there is the uh, Badayu inscription of uh, Rashtrakutas who were feudatories of the line of Jayachandra Gahadwal. They say that no Muslim could venture near Ganga now. Then there is a early 15th century uh, text Purush Pariksha by Vidyapati. Uh, in, I think he was a Methan scholar. He was a pretty neutral author. He was not uh, patronized by Gahadwals or their descendants. Uh, there are no positive or negative links with Gahadwals. So he mentions that Jayachandra you know, was conducting battles with the Islamic powers. No collision there as well whatsoever. 14th century Islamic text Futuhat Salatin uh, by Abdul Malik Isami. It covers uh, uh, Ghori's uh, failed attempt toward Gujarat, 1178 AD, which we uh, earlier covered. So by mistake, Isami has mentioned that the Indian army in 1178 was led by Jayachandra instead of talking about Solankis. But you notice that even in mistake, the Islamic sources would still portray Jaichand as an enemy only. Then there is the uh, Turushk Dand. So Turushk Dand was a, a sort of a tax which was applied by Gahadwals in the 12th century to, to fund the wars against uh, Islamic powers. And when the when we see the Chauhan Tomer alliance was keeping the Northwest uh, pretty secure. So at that time, the Gahadwals were re relieved of that pressure, right? So then Jaichandra removes the Turushk Dand, and it was seen as a very popular step, uh, giving much relief to his, his uh, population as well. So after this, I'll come to our uh, famous text, Prithviraj Raso, because a lot of people, what they do is they have this misconception that the Raso portrays uh, Jaichandra as a traitor. Even to this day, I see people, you know, doing and uploading YouTube videos that, okay, Raso has done this, Raso has done that. But not just that, uh, many people have taken those who prefer to read Western scholars, the Western scholars like Cynthia Talbot on face value. Because see, uh, not, not even once, but twice in her book on Prithvira Chauhan, uh, Cynthia Talbot, who, who is a professor, I believe, in a US university, uh, in her book, there is, a, there is this charge that the Raso calls Jayachandra a, a traitor. The fact is, there is not even a single recension or manuscript of the Raso which calls Jayachandra a traitor. Absolutely not. Nothing even remotely close to that. On the contrary, the poet of Raso extols Jaichandra, praises him for putting Gauri into fear. So that, that's about it. And one more reason for these allegations, oh, he was a traitor, he was a traitor, is that uh, there is a particular uh, mention in a Jain text named Prithviraj Prabandh. It says that when Prithviraj Chauhan had died in the battle against Gauri, <clears throat> sorry, so at that time, Jaichand was very happy with the news. And to celebrate, he had his city illuminated with lamps. Uh, he, he had a Diwali of sorts. Now, what are the problems in accepting this? The events belong to the end of 12th century AD, right? But the Prithviraj Prabandh itself belongs to the end of 15th century AD. That's 300 years in between, not even a near contemporary source. Secondly, most of the Jain literary tradition of Northwest India 
it owed a lot to the patronage of Solankis, who for the most part happened to be arch enemies of the Chauhans. So you'll find it in numerous Jain texts that they go to the extra length in admonishing or criticizing Prithviraj in taking credit of actual battles away from a Chauhan ruler and giving it to someone else like they did with his father Someshwar Chauhan. One of the Jain texts uh, goes as far as saying that uh, Prithviraj was sleeping in his military camp for 10 days. I think it was Prithviraj Prabhand only. So with all this, you, you know, it becomes a bit hard to consume the judgmental statements about Prithviraj or Jaichand from these texts. And lastly, a logical thing. If Jaichand was a bitter enemy of Prithviraj, then after the Chauhan king had died, Instead of celebrating, shouldn't Jaichandra be worried about the safety of his daughter, who was the uh, causes ballet of uh, this enmity? Shouldn't he be worried about the safety of his daughter or maybe mourning her death? Because according to Raso, uh, immediately when the news of uh, Prithviraj's uh, demise came to Sanyogita, uh, she also uh, left her body. She died then and there. So, and then uh, there is this uh, important difference uh, between being a rival or enemy to some other king, I mean, who wasn't, and being a traitor who would make bonds with the militias just to get even with an arch enemy of his own creed. So, yes, Jaichandra may have been a rival of Prithviraj, although we have no solid proof for that because th these two guys didn't even share a border. So that's another myth. They didn't even share a border. But regardless, how does that possibility make Jaichandra a traitor? Right. And another thing about traitors is that uh, the collective memory of the host society would certainly retain that treachery somewhere, if done, that is. And what it does is it sullies the name. For example, there was a time when it was it was said that, you know, uh, Pran was a villain brand in Bollywood, right? And and parents wouldn't name their kids as, as Pran because of the negativity it brings. So, but, but if you see, for hundreds of years after these epochal events of the 12th century, we see no such thing, no such negativity tagging to the name of Jaichand. In the West, he is praised to the skies in the medieval literature of Rajasthan like Prithviraj Raso, Ajit Vilas, Suraj Prakash. If you look at the other end, Bengal region in the east, the Bengal's rulers had some tussle with Jaichan back then. So I can easily imagine that at least in Bengal, they would not have any soft spot for Jaichan, right? Now, when you check the British gazettes of Bengal, you see that men of the elite sections of the society are happily using the name Jaichan. So the negative memory part is not there in our collective memory at all. Right. So this thing, all of this, this whole debunking of the evidence brings us to a tipping point. What the hell happened? I mean, why was this man who laid down his life fighting the militias like his ancestors did? The man who gave us the Tretake Thakur temple inscription, which was crucial evidence in the Ramjan Bhumi case. Why was this man admonished so badly? And an even more piercing question for larger introspection is, why did we continue believing these lies even decades after the independence? So I'll, I'll leave the introspection part to our viewers and I'll get to the genesis of this nasty myth. Genesis lies in the Aine Akbari, written in the end of 16th century AD by Abul Fazl. So Abul Fazl was like a, a bard for the Mughals. And when he started writing a Delhi-centric history for Mughals, he hit a two-fold problem. One was that Delhi had the status of being like a capital of the north uh, for centuries now, even before Akbar. And the uh, Hindu counter-narrative had risen the memory of Prithviraj Chauhan uh, to the stature of a, of a Delhi-based Hindu samrat. So in his account of Delhi, Abul Fazl can't escape Prithviraj now. Second problem 
uh, was that uh, not only was an imperial Muslim power sitting in the Delhi Agra region in the 16th century at that time, but historically in the 12th century when Prithviraj ruled, there had been a pretty violent power transition from Hindu forces to Muslim powers around the same Delhi Agra region involving Prithviraj and Shahbuddin Ghori, a couple other players. So Abul Fazl was forced to talk about that transition as well. Now that's a problem because his requirement, the requirement of Abul Fazl as a Mughal bard was to somehow absolve the Muslim powers from the blame of the mayhem of 12th century, which was epochal, we know. So what does he do? He invents a villain in Jaichandra. Mr. Abul Fazl was the first person to spout this lie that it was Jaichandra who called Ghori to India to settle his scores with Prithviraj Chauhan. So Abul Fazl basically wanted to project that, look, whatever happened back then, it wasn't our fault. It was your people who called us here to help with their own issues. And obviously, Abul Fazl gives no source of this statement. Now, why is the source important? If, if I were to tell you, sir, that, uh, you know, 400 years ago, there was a dinosaur of XYZ breed and he did such and such things. So you would say, okay, well, well you were not there at the time, right? And this is something new I'm hearing for the first time. So, dude, what's your source? How do you know? And if I don't give my source, then are you going to believe me? No. So, well, then we, we shouldn't believe Abul Fazl as well, because despite being 400 years away from the events he narrates, he does not give a source. So that's how this myth is a myth. And that's how it came into being. The, the, the Genesis part is understandable and I've explained it. What what bewilders and saddens me at the same time is the long and pervasive life that this myth has had in a society and in all the sections, laymen, intellectuals, you name it, everybody. So that, that's a bit painful. Yeah. So could you speak briefly about the achievements of Maharaj Jayachandra? I mean, where did he rule and what were his achievements? Uh, yeah, so his rule basically was from around uh, Gaya in the east and uh, up to the, um, the around the Meerut uh, Aligarh uh, area in the west, close to that. So that was the uh, overall geography. And uh, toward the south, he, his, his kingdom bordered the uh, countries of uh, this thing, uh, Kalinger. Yeah. So that was the geographic expanse. Um, and uh, in terms of achievements, uh, I would say uh, there was a lot of uh, patronage to temples, building temples. And uh, whenever he, he was able to, you know, sort of... Uh, Thwart the Muslim invasions, he did uh, bring relief to his population by reducing the taxes. And um, yeah, I think uh, that's pretty much about it. But uh, the, yeah, I, I, I don't uh, pretty much remember uh, specific achievements uh, other than that. But he, he did lay down his life uh, fighting for the uh, for the Hindus and uh, trying to protect his people. Yeah. All right. A very interesting discussion. We have lay, we have covered a whole uh, gamut of, of events in this discussion. So thank you so much. You are really very knowledgeable. And uh, I look forward to having more discussions with you. Thank you so much for, for this. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thanks.